ending one minute at a time. I was blind, but now I see. Working jobs we hate, so we buy shit we don't need. Ideas are brittle. If you had one shot, everything I'd ever read, heard, seen was now organized and available. Now you fucking khakis. Life moves pretty fast. The Biohacking Secret Show. What's up, everybody? We have a fantastic episode of the Biohacking Secrets show for you today. If you have experienced any degree of mystery illness, chronic illness, Lyme disease, headaches, uh, chemical sensitivities, fibromyalgia, arthritis, chronic fatigue, depression, anxiety, or there's someone that you love who has experienced those hardships that you're really going to want to tune in because we are bringing you Larry Schwartz from safestartiaq.com, and we are going to be presenting a masterclass on mold toxicity. Larry is one of the best in the world at mold testing and figuring out if an environment that you work in or live in has been negatively impacted, and he's going to give us an overview on what mold toxicity is, how to diagnose it, how to test for it, how to remediate, whether to move or not to move, and perhaps most importantly, how to get better. So without further ado, please welcome my friend, Larry Schwartz, to the Biohacking Secret Show. What's up, Larry? How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much, Anthony. It's my honor and pleasure to be here. Likewise, likewise. I am I'm very pumped. I just, as I mentioned to you before we started recording, got out of uh, a 35 degree Lake Michigan up here in Door County, Wisconsin. Um, it's one of one of my favorite things to do is is to you know get in a nice freezing lake and get some sunshine and get charged up for a podcast like this. And I know that the things that we're going to be sharing today are going to be uh, super valuable for for people listening. Maybe you can give us a little bit of an overview on uh, what is mold toxicity for for those individuals that aren't familiar, and um, you know some of the broad strokes of how many people this is impacting, and 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 how it's so often misdiagnosed. Great. Before I I answer that, let me explain that I work with and within groups of physicians and colleagues uh, that are in 24-7 communications and conferences and speaking engagements uh, that work in this field. Medically, it falls under what's called integrative or functional medicine, mm -hmm. as opposed to general Western medicine. They're regular ordained credentialed MDs, but this is their field of specialty. So it's, for example, if you have a symptom and you go to your regular doctor, your internist, nothing against them, they're great helpers and they're for so many good, good uses, that they, they will tend to more treat a symptom than to figure out all the time what is the cause and how is the cause corrected. So those are some of the differentials in these types of medicine. The integrative is looking more at all kinds of solutions and getting to the root cause of things and how to deal with the root cause. So here's the deal. This group I work with and, 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 and other professionals, we've calculated there's 20 to 30 million people in this country that have a condition, it's an inflammatory condition that creates so many of these symptoms and problems and they don't know it. And they're not necessarily getting the correct treatments to deal with it. And the, the condition is called Chronic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. It has an acronym pronounced SIRS, spelled in capital C-I-R-S. Uh, this was discovered about 20 years ago by a physician out east named Dr. Richie Shoemaker in Maryland, that time a country doctor. And he had a client who had all these symptoms and he diagnosed actually an illness this patient had from tainted uh, reef fish called Sigulatera, but he found a treatment for it with what's called a binder that takes the toxins and poisons out of the body. It binds to the toxins and takes them out. And he therefore came up with a medical protocol on how to treat patients with inflammatory illness 
taking inflammagens called cytokines out of the out of the body. They're normal things everybody has, but I'll get into this a little bit more. I want to tell you that there's these 20 to 30 million people. I mean, this is really a huge epidemic and not a lot of people know about it. And for a lot of reasons, there's a ton of confusion. So a lot of what I'm going to tell you will be helpful. And if you have these kind of symptoms, it doesn't mean you have this illness per se, but you might. So the deal is people I feel in water damage situations fall into one of three categories. If they're really lucky, they don't fall into one of the other two. And one of them is I call traditional and one I call inflammatory. They're like different universes. I'm going to call each one a paradigm. And in the traditional, we know 5 to 10% of the population has allergy and irritation to mold and water damage issues. And the symptoms are primarily upper respiratory, things like wheezing, sneezing, coughing, sinus headaches. And you go away from the water damage or mold or you get rid of it and these symptoms resolve. About 95 to 99% or more of your physicians, your remediation people, your insurance adjusters, your home inspectors, and so on, work and operate in this paradigm. For example, you buy a home and you have a home inspection. The home inspector finds mold in a closet. And then you call in a mold expert who comes and tests and writes a plan on how to treat and get rid of the mold safely. And they put up a containment. They remove or use chemicals to treat it. When it's done, the mold guy comes back and does spore trap air testing in the work area and outdoors. And everything compares well. Containments come down. The letter goes out. The home's healthy and safe for occupancy. Restoration begins. Okay, that is treating the people that have the fall in this traditional paradigm. The real irony is in the inflammatory paradigm, we know more than 24% of the population fall into this. And they're born with certain genes. Here's the good news. I'm not going to give you guys a midterm so you don't have to memorize all this. But at least 50% of, uh, no, I'm sorry, at least 24% or more, we, we have strong evidence it's more, but people have these genes that fall in a category called HLA haplotypes. And there's six or eight of these specific genes that relate to the propensity to develop Lyme disease from a tick bite. Some of these, uh, if, they're, if these genes are turned on, a bunch of these genes, they keep your body from getting rid of normal levels of cytokines at a fast rate. And as they build up, we've learned there's 36 type of symptoms that might come on. Fortunately, nobody we work with has all 36. And they tend to fall into groups of eight. And the physicians look at these, uh, these symptoms in, in the diagnosis of this illness, as well as other things I'll explain. But every one of these are very common symptoms. They're the kind of things you either wouldn't think much of or you go to the doctor to get a treatment. We're talking about some of the more common ones are what we call brain fog, like a confusion, uh, what we call brain fire, some pretty severe headaches, uh, vertigo, uh, joint pain, chronic fatigue, what we call leaky gut. There's a whole bunch of these symptoms. And when, when one has a bunch of these, I mean, you normally will just go to your doctor. So if you want to know if you have a, a mold illness, so to speak, you would go to one of these functional or integrative physicians or healthcare providers, and they would run some blood tests. They'll run a panel called a biotoxin panel. And the deal is this, this serves this chronic inflammatory response syndrome is made up of different uh, symptoms and different systems of the body. So it's a multi-system, multi-symptom illness. And 
the biotoxin blood panel will measure levels of different levels of different systems of the body. One of them, for example, is called C4A, which is a measure of your innate immune system. One is called TGF beta 1, which is kind of a measure of inflammation in the body. And there's six, seven others. So they do this blood panel and they look at the symptoms. And from that, they may or may not want to do a genetic blood test to see if you have these GLA haplotypes. Uh, I work with uh, doctors at Functional Medical Cleveland Clinic. They, for example, generally don't do the GLA haplotype test. You don't need it to make a diagnosis. But from generally the symptoms and the blood test, they may diagnose what's called chronic inflammatory response syndrome. We find there's a high association of people that have Lyme disease with chronic inflammatory response. Not sure of all the reasons. There's uh, some physicians who are very well known in the field of Alzheimer's that uh, have, have evidence that what's called type three early onset Alzheimer's has a high correlation with uh, mold inf inflammation for people that have inflammatory illness. Mm, and a lot of the treatments that are given to those patients beside binders is making sure their homes or workplaces are safe for them. So I wanna kind of go in to give you an analogy to kind of drive home how this works. If you picture in your body as an empty tank, like an empty gasoline tank, and at the bottom there's a drain with a valve to open and close it, and at the top there's an inlet with a valve to open and close it, and in your life, as you encounter every day different inflammagens, they go in through the inlet into this tank and they build up a level of inflammagens. They're typically made up of what are called cytokines. And if you have the vulnerabilities with these turned on uh, genes, this tank won't drain. The valve won't be open to drain it out. If you have a certain level of, of inflammagens in this tank and they're not draining, you might feel symptomatic with these things I'm talking about, and you might find that whether you're in your home, your workplace, or anywhere, the symptoms are constant. If that tank is drained and it's a very low level or empty, you might find differences of symptoms, whether you're in your home or outdoors or in a workplace or a gym or somewhere else. So the physician's job, beside all the other good things they do for you, is to give you meds called binders that will help open the, the valve at the bottom to drain the tank. Here's yeah, like I'm, like cholestyramine. Huh. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's that's one of them, right? Okay. And and Larry, I'm I'm going to turn it back over to you in just a sec, but I just want to ask: Is do you feel so? There's there's a lot of testing around mold there's testing the individual with like you know you mentioned like the the biotoxin test like the great plains laboratory has a mycotoxin test um i know some physicians will use like a, a like the schumacher schumacher biotoxin mold illness panel um and then you said some will just use symptom-based diagnoses and, and test the home to see do you prefer any one of those, or is there a, a, another approach that you feel is is more accurate? Because you've got a lot of experience here, and tests get expensive, right? But, so the deal is, it's interesting because I, I've been given a lot of the medical education at the conferences and from the doctors, but I'm not the doc. But where I have an interesting perspective is that I work with referring physicians all over the country and out of the country. And many of them have different approaches and methods of what you're describing and asking. Mm -hmm. And I get to kind of see a cross section of what, what seems to work. And in the chat rooms, I, I get their perspective on why they feel one way or another about different testing. So I'm, I'm kind of an interesting reservoir and resource of a lot of ways of, of uh, skinning, skinning the, the, the cat, so to speak. But the deal is, is that, but let me go through a couple of these methods. Sure. Some of the doctors like what's called 
uh, real time or great planes. It's a mycotoxin testing urine. Mm -hmm. And before a patient is given that, most doctors like to give a stimulant to push mycotoxins out of the body to get a maximum response in the reading. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of discussion I've been privy in that some of the doctors feel that test measures, maybe if the levels are high of mycotoxins, that means your body's just doing a good job of getting rid of them. Or the other thought is, these mycotoxins come from both environmental and foods you eat. Grains, especially corn and oats and cereals, have mycotoxins on them. And there's no way to differentiate what percent of the result is from food, what's from environment. Mm. Some of the doctors feel this is a great diagnostic tool, and some of them feel if they use it at all, they prefer to use it to measure differences as you make differences in your homework treatments to see changes that are good or bad. Mm -hmm. So it can be used in a lot of ways, but like anything, you know, it's not perfect. It depends how your physician wants to deal with it. And there's some, some things unanswered. The biotoxin blood panel was developed with the Shoemaker Group. And, you know, that seems to work really well. A lot of docs do that. Uh, and they've just the, made that available on through life extension. So if, right. if, if someone, yeah, people now have access to get that test and to buy it on their own without a doctor's prescription. Now you still probably would uh, want to work with someone trained in the Schumacher yeah. protocol to interpret yeah. your results. You interpret it, right. <laughs> but it's, it's, now it's, it's another it's really nice. expensive, easy test you could do at home on your computer. It's called a VCS, like Victor, mm -hmm. uh, Charlie, uh, Sam, it, mm -hmm. it's a visual contrast sensitivity. And I think you can Google and find one place you can get it free. You can get it off Shoemaker's website at survivingmold.com. And you're gonna look at a bunch of different images with a lot of lines and different directions and shapes. And you're gonna answer questions. And basically it measures a perception of shapes and contrast in an area of your brain that gets affected by inflammatory illness. And they can tell like right eye, left eye, what the results are. It's about 90% accurate in diagnosing a chronic inflammatory type of thing. But know this, I've worked with a lot of people that are patients that may fail that or may have high inflammation, but don't necessarily have the full blown uh, illness. And some people might have high markers of C4A of their innate immune system, but it may be caused by some other irritant or stimulus other than, than having this illness. So, you know, you really need a doctor's interpretation to help you. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as, you know, you mentioned binders like cholestyramine, the prescription ones are cholestyramine, we call it CSM. It took me a month to be able to say that word, by the way. <laughs> it's kind of a tongue twister. It is. And another one's called Wellcall. Uh, and, and a lot of docs prescribe, they start with non-prescription, like there's things that have activated charcoal and bentonite clay that mm -hmm. act as binders. You know, Shoemaker's protocol says, you know, you really need to do the cholestyramine. You know, you do, some doctors like to start with less strong binders. So, I mean, it's, it's very individualized that everybody that has this has different spectrums how they react. Let me give you some examples. Some of the patients that have this, the, first of all, the number one thing they react to is water damage residuals. And I'll get into that in a little bit. You can ask me some questions on that. But some react to volatile organic compounds and chemicals. A lot of the patients have uh, chemicals, fragrance sensitivities. Some people get activated by formaldehyde fumes, electromagnetic fields. So there's a spectrum, not only on what causes symptoms, but how deep the symptoms get. I was with a client once at, a, at their table, meeting with them and talking. I had to turn off my iPad and my iPhone. They were getting headaches from that. Mm. So, I mean, it, it's a, a lot of patients have another, are on another spectrum as to 
the severity of their illness and their symptoms. I work with people that have, the lucky ones have good days, bad days, they can hold a job. Bad days might be severe and tough to get out of bed. And I work with people at the other end, including children in high school and such, that are in bed 18 hours a day, joint pain, fatigue, chronic fatigue, can't function, and everything in between. So there's no standard that's the same for everybody. Where I come into it is helping people shut off that valve of what's going into that tank that I talked about. So we work synergistically with the physicians. When I say we, I'm what's called an indoor environmental professional. Uh, I have some additional things. I'm a certified indoor environmental consultant. I'm a graduate engineer. Uh, I have uh, certifications in use of infrared and different equipment. And I've been involved in over probably over 10,000 investigations, about 1,500 with inflammatory patients. And right now, basically 99% of the work I do is referrals from patients, physicians, and working with the physicians to get it right. Mm -hmm. And guys, I just want to mention, like we, uh, my family, when we suspected that we might be dealing with a, a mold issue in our basement, um, we brought in Larry to handle the testing and uh, to to help us figure out if if there was something going on. So um, the you know the reason that we're having this conversation is because uh, I trust him. He's vetted and he does phenomenal work. And, you know, if you guys um, multiple times throughout this episode, I'll share safe start. I a Q is his website. S a F E S T A R T I a Q as in like indoor air quality.com. And if, if you guys are someone, you know, maybe dealing with mold toxicity, that's the best place to go to sign up to have a conversation with someone from his team and maybe take the next step like I did and having Larry come out and check your home. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Larry, please, please continue. Okay, great. Well, let's talk a little about the environment in the home. And because this is where, and the, and the doctors tell the patients and everything, I can do what I can to drain the tank. But the first step is to keep the tank from getting filled up. Mm -hmm. So. Workplaces and homes, you know, have all kind of environmental things. The World Health Organization says at least half the built environments have had water damage. I think it's more than that. Uh, and water comes in in different ways. It doesn't mean necessarily a rough penetration leaking or wind blowing, you know, around a window into the home. That all happens, that kind of stuff. But there's a lot of hidden things where condensation occurs behind walls in attics uh, in different places. So the whole science of what, you know, what produces condensation, how do you control it? The biggest thing is controlling moisture and humidity in a building to prevent water damage. So here's some interesting little stories that'll tie together at the end. <laughs> so bear with me. I like stories. One of them is that we've learned that when you have water on building material, over 30 known biologic life forms may start growing and they all eat what they grow on. And the food source is typically cellulose or organic material that it grows on. So like when you see mold on a piece of bread, that mold's actually eating the bread. The cells have little roots that go into the bread and the water is needed to help dissolve the food source along with enzymes that go up through the roots into the cells to give them energy to grow. So that's one concept that's very important. However, the main things that I think are growing are the molds and life forms called environmental bacteria. They're bacteria that may have some species, but mostly are not pathogenic, not growing at body temperature, but they're a life form that grows they too want the water to grow. So when things grow with water, it's, it's real interesting in the last year we're learning because we've been focusing mainly on mold. We're learning now there's a species of environmental bacteria called actinomycetes, 
we abbreviated actinos, and that those also stimulate symptoms in inflammatory patients along with mold. Mm -hmm. They all fight for the same available water to allow them to grow and live. Mm -hmm. So that uh, you, we may test and find good on the mold things, but there may be bad on the environmental bacteria. Mm -hmm. So like when we test now, I'll start with the least expensive test with the mold stuff and where we have actual empirical evidence with test numbers and result that can tell what, what are the relapse rates of a patient coming back in their home if these test levels are X, Y, and Z. But let's say the, the test levels come back good. And you know, instead of saying, well, this home is environmentally safe, we don't know yet that it is. So we generally take other samples that we may want to process if the mold stuff comes back good to see if the actinos are high. And there's a third product that we measure called endotoxins, which are particles that come off cell walls of dead environmental bacteria, or what are called lipopolysaccharides, that at high density can cause some real other serious health effects. But they also stimulate symptoms in inflammatory patients. And by the way, some of the other inflammatory illnesses are known as like mast cell activation, POTS, PANS. There's a whole plethora of different inflammatory illnesses that you need the right environment to help treat all of these. We're not going to go into all of those right now. Yeah. No, but it is it is a good point you bring up. Like it's very, it's very difficult. This is this is having worked with people of from all walks of life, different ages, different geographical locations, it's very hard to get better in the same environment that made you sick. Now, that doesn't mean you must move. I'm talking about if you don't know that there's something in your environment that's making you sick, you know, let's say it's, it's, it's mold in this case, um, if you don't adequately remediate that mold, no matter how much you do, you may be just kind of spinning your wheels trying to get better. And, and that's why these types of, of processes and diagnostics and testing is absolutely critical. And, and as we get a little bit further, we'll talk about, you know, when it makes sense to move, when it makes sense to remediate and all of that. But I just wanted to kind of reiterate whether we're talking about mold toxicity, POTS, Lyme disease, anything, it's, it's very, very hard to get better in the same environment that made you sick you know, without making some, some shifts. Back to you, Larry. Great. So, yeah, and I want to get into all these other things you're talking about, Anthony, but let me talk to you about the testing methods a little bit. And you know what? Even before that, I just want to say the function myself and my colleagues play is that our first step is to assess the reality of the situation in a building. And to properly assess, it's not just like taking a mold test, and we're going to talk about testing in a minute. And we're not just assessing the situation as to how good or bad it is, if it's healthy or toxic or whatever, but we need to assess what are the sources and causes of the problem. Mm -hmm. Because we, before we recommend any treatments, we have to stop and cap off the sources. So you don't spend a lot of time, money treating the building and having it all recycle and happen over and over. And it gets very tricky, and every building has its own unique personality. Unlike medicine, where bodies are all constructed the same way inside, buildings are not. There's different heating systems, different ventilation systems, different plumbing systems, different levels, different layouts, different geography, different exterior issues. So every building has to be looked at in a unique way as to What's going on inside the building? What's going in? What's coming out? What's happening in the middle? So that, that's where a lot of our thought power and critical thinking goes. So treatments are not always the same in one building to another. Mm -hmm. So after we assess the causes and try to figure out ways to correct and stop the causes, we then come up with a plan, okay, how do we treat the building to make it healthy? And there's three general methods, which we'll get into later, but just for its headings, 
One is ventilation, one's air purification, one is cleaning. And in some cases, it may take all of one or some or all of a specific two. In some cases, some or all of all three of those to get a correction. Again, a lot of critical thinking of taking data and labs and figuring out how, you know, what do you need to do? And then we have to work with the client. Is this financially feasible? And sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. And then we get into decisions to help the client. Does it make sense to move or not? And if you're going to move, you know, what are the issues there? What about my content? How and what do I take? How can I clean it? Should I clean it here or there? Uh, how do I protect it during the move? How do I check out another place I'm going to? Whether I'm renting or buying, is it a condo, a townhouse, a standalone home? How do I check it out? How do I assess the risk of that new place to stay or be good? So we have a lot of ways to work with this and answer these questions. And there are alternatives if things aren't financially possible. Some of it might be, I gave a talk once called to move or not to move, that's the question. It's a funny title because I never read Shakespeare, but I always liked that line. I've got to get around to it one of these days. Yeah, you know, I did I did in high school and uh, it wasn't my cup of tea, but you know. <laughs> no, I was more into the science stuff. Right, yeah, me too. Now, let me tell you about the testing that you've probably heard of. You've probably heard the strange name Ermi or Hurts Me. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've test. yeah. These are the two that we've used when a client said, hey, how do I test my place, you know, on my own? It's, I'd say, get the Hurts Me Too test or the, the ERMI test from the en Envirobiomics website. What's up, guys? Anthony DiClemente here, and this message is brought to you by Buy Optimizers. So a few years ago, I was in a frustrating situation. After just about every meal, I would experience gas, bloating, stomach distension, constipation, even diarrhea. And this three-month gut reset protocol completely changed the game. I'd tried a ton of things. Nothing had really worked that well until I did this. So what I did was I combined masszymes, bioptimizers enzyme formulation that helps to break down protein and increase your own immune system's effectiveness with their probiotic at a specific dosage of 10 capsules of masszymes with five capsules of the P3O and probiotic taken in the morning on an empty stomach and then at night on an empty stomach. And right away, I started seeing some positive improvements. Then I added another six capsules of the masszymes and three capsules of the P3O and probiotic before each meal. Meal. And a few months of that, specifically three months, nine bottles worth, my gut was almost completely fixed. Throwing a little bit of gasoline on the fire, I made sure to fast for 14 to 16 hours between dinner and my first meal the next day to increase autophagy, upregulate the immune system, and help clear out some of the other viruses, bacteria, even parasites that can inhabit our, our gut. And that made a massive difference for me. And if you're experiencing any of these symptoms, it will probably make a massive difference for you. So if you guys want to check out that gut reset protocol, it requires nine bottles of the masszymes, nine bottles of the P3OM, and you can get it at buyoptimizers.com forward slash biohacks. We've got all the discount codes already applied and put together a nice, a, a nice way for you guys to save on the package when you go there. That's B I O P T I M. I Z E R S dot com slash biohacks, B I O H A C K S. And you'll see the three month gut reset protocol that includes nine bottles of masszymes and nine bottles of P3OM. Take it as recommended, and you will see a huge improvement in your gut health. Check it out. Another good lab is out in New Jersey called Mycometrics, M Y C O M E T R I C S. Uh, Mycometrics does just the Hertz Me, Ermi, they do other stuff. They don't have the equipment to do the NGS sequencing for the actinos and the endotoxins and virobiomics does mm. here in San Antonio. But those two are the best labs for this kind of stuff. Yeah, guys, and the spelling on these, just so you know, it's Hurts Me, H-E-R-T-S-M-I, and then that's the, you know, the Hurts Me test from Envirobiomics, and then there's the ERMI test, E-R-M-I, and uh, Larry, you you use those as well when you're doing your deep dives and, and um, checking out environments, correct? 
I do. Let me tell you a little about them, what their what their names mean, how they developed, and how we use them. Yeah, please. And I think I need to go into a really important thing that if you're going to do collection yourself of dust for these tests, there's some protocols I need to talk to you about that are critically important. So these tests, I mean, you're going to make big time decisions and money decisions on these results. And you very often get very, very biased test results if you don't think about it and do it the right way. Mm -hmm. So it's critically important. ERMI stands for Environmental Relative Moldiness Index. There's a PhD at the CPA who's there now, who was there 20 years ago, given a task of measuring moldiness differences in homes. It was not a medical deal. He and his team came up with this test, this ERMI test, and they put together 36 mold species in this test. Now, you hear names of mold like Cladosporium, Aspergillus, et cetera. They're called in Latin, the genus, they're like a family name. As a family name, I call it the family name. And as they grow, they develop variations of themselves called species. I call them the children because they have two names now, like Aspergillus versicolor, Aspergillus flavus, not just Aspergillus. Aspergillus has over a hundred different species. And when you do, for example, spore trap air testing, which is in the traditional realm, uh, that's measuring what's in the air at a five minute point in time. It's measuring only the genus, not the species. And you need to get to the species level and in inflammatory work because each species associates, associates with developing specific chemicals uh, specific to that species during their growth and their metabolism. So for example, when mold grows, I'm gonna get back to the army in a minute. I keep going on these sidetracks, I have to do it. <laughs> so, so when the mold grows and it's metabolizing, it has water, it's metabolizing, the genuses are developing into species, the species are creating chemicals. So on a microscopic scale, these chemicals are used to kill, overtake, and grow over their neighbors and take domination or for defense. The species with the strongest chemicals tend to win out. And when all this microscopic warfare goes on, these chemicals and cellular material emit and spew out into the air where they attach to dust, personal content, books, computers, pictures, walls, ceiling, shelves, and they dry. And when they dry, there's confusion. People think this is mold. They say, I don't see any mold in the house. How can it be affecting me? So they have these dried invisible chemical contaminants dried on surfaces. When those are disturbed and get in the air, those affect symptoms of the inflammatory patient. So the big bang of the mold growth could have been five years ago, yesterday, 10 or 20 years ago, and if the stuff they spewed out and coated in your home are still there, they still get in the air and affect you if you're a patient. I know it sounds real science fiction and hard to believe, but that's the deal. Mm -hmm. So the inflammatory patient may react from chemicals on spores. Spores, more I feel, tend to affect the traditional patient with the upper uh, respiratory issues. So some people are unlucky and react just in a traditional paradigm, some in an inflammatory paradigm, and the most unlucky react in both of them. They have both allergic and inflammatory effects. Mm -hmm. So getting back to what happens in this army. Well, yeah, let's, let's do that in just a sec, because you just reminded me as you were talking through these different scenarios, like when I, you know, my plan after uh, moving from Florida was to buy land and uh, land close to nature. You know, one of the things that I've found is, is perhaps the most powerful biohack is just living more in harmony with nature. And I was like, all right, now is my opportunity to do that. So I was, um, I was crashing while I looked for land in uh, the basement of the house I grew up in. And at first I didn't feel any, I felt great and you know, I felt normal. And, um, but then as, as I got a few months in, I started noticing I was getting more and more tired and I started noticing like 
even feelings of like low mood, depression kind of creeping in. And I remember laying uh, downstairs in bed with my dog and I'm coughing. And as I'm coughing, you know, I, I, I stopped and, and then I noticed my dog was coughing. And I'm like, he does, my dog doesn't cough. What the heck is going on? <laughs> and, and I said, you know, we got to get this place tested, you know, and that was what, what sent us down the path of looking for, you know, who are, who are some great people that really do excellent work. And that's how we found safe start IAQ and Larry and, and brought him in was, was noticing like, you know, the, uh, the traditional symptoms, which was you know, the obvious you're coughing, right. Or, or you're, you've got, you know, nasal congestion or some of these other allergic symptoms. Symptoms, but the the immune and inflammatory stuff that's where you deal with depression fatigue brain fog you know and i was i was kind of having a little bit of a little bit of both so i just wanted to mention that little story before we get into the ermy um because you know it, it gives some context to uh, what larry's sharing too yeah there's yeah I, I appreciate all that that's all i get it the ermy is made up of concentrations of 36 species of mold in two groups. If you look at a lab report, it'll have a group one and a group two. Group one has about 20 species, group two, 16, total of 36. Group one are mold species more associated with water damage on building materials and cellulose. Group two are mold species, more usual household molds. And there are numbers next to each species in the lab report. And their title is equivalent spores per milligram of dust. The owner of one of the labs, I chatted with him one day and asked him, you know, his name was King T. King T, what's an equivalent spore? I never heard of that. We had a half hour discussion till I got it. And what it is, they have an algorithm. They're machines that use what's called polymerase chain reaction they actually use a DNA identification of these species. And based on how many hits they get for a species, they have an algorithm that equates to an equivalent spore per milligram of dust. So those numbers represent a concentration of that species on the dust. <clears throat> now, let me back up a little on ERMI. When this Dr. Vesper at the EPA developed this, he came up with the dust collection protocol of using a canister on a vacuum and collecting dust from two square meters of flooring in a home. As he felt since everything in the air settles, that's the best place to measure. And for what he wanted to do, that was a great way to measure and collect dust. What we do, and I try to tell at conferences and all I speak at, we should not call what we do ERMI testing because we're not following his original protocol for dust collection. <clears throat> we're often using, we may use a canister for certain reasons on flooring, but we collect dust on like a Swiffer cloth, which creates a static electrical charge when you rub it on a surface that pulls dust off surfaces. And we want to get dust, I'll go through, you know, how to collect the most realistic dust in a minute. But my point is we're not doing the real original ERMI in itself. We're working with an ERMI presentation of data to get data and use that. But we're not really doing an ERMI test. And you're thinking, okay, why do I need to know this? Uh, down the line, you'll see some reasons for that. But we could, we could test just content. We could test just, just structure and walls. We could test combinations. I've been in homes where the, the person in the home is moving and I'm working on behalf of the person moving in. I don't necessarily need to test the content of the person that's taking it with them, but more what's going to remain just on the walls and that kind of thing. So, you know, we have to think, Here's a big problem. A lot of doctors and all will give a pay, tell them, you know, go to the lab, they'll send you a kit, do an army test. And they'll combine the dust on two levels or all three levels or, you know, upper, upper levels in a basement all together. To get the information I need, I need to isolate them by level. 
And I don't do an army necessarily on all levels, and I'll tell you why. But besides the info I get from the lab report as to these concentrations of mold species that give me empirical evidence that I can tell you what the relapse rate would be for a patient with these lab results, I can look at a basement separated from an upper level, and I can tell you the degree of outdoor contaminants coming in as opposed to what's being created in the home and what you need to do to correct and stop that action. You're not getting that from the test you're doing. And you don't yeah, have to it, 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 it gets pretty ninja. And like, mm -hmm. you know, I think, I think the mistake that a lot of people make is, okay, what's the best mold test? They spend their time figuring out what the best mold test is. And they hear about the Ermi test or the Hertz meat test. And then they think that uh, that's the, the work, right? And they just order that and follow the directions and problem solved where the more, you know, about this, um, you know, I, I, someone like myself has a great deal of experience and I chose to work with you because I know how much I could screw up just by buying a hurts me test or an ermy test. And, you know, a mistake in this area could send you, years down the wrong path you know right. you think you think oh no i tested for mold and it came back negative well you tested wrong you know what i mean you didn't look at the, you, the implications you are incredible yes getting yes. realistic results I, I i totally agree so let me tell you where hurts me came ermy doctors found after a while the, the way they scored it they did a mathematical deal because these raw scores on the ermy might range from a single digit to six digits of value. This uh, Dr. Vesper took what are called logarithms of these numbers. Basically, it converted them to very small numbers that retain the value. And he added up the logarithms of group one and group two. He subtracted two from one. It's called the Army score. Doctors found over time, if that score were equal or less than 2.1, patients did better on binders, getting better. And the higher the ERMI score, the worse they did. Well, when you think about what that ERMI score really means, you, most of you guys aren't, there aren't mathematicians, I'm not either, but if you can remember back, logarithm of A plus logarithm of B really means A times B. And logarithm of A minus logarithm B really means A divided by B. Don't try and think about whether that's real or not, it's the deal. But what that ERMI score represents is, is the product of multiplying all the raw scores in group one times each other and dividing that by the product of all the raw scores in group two times each other. So what that really means is, or what you need to know, if, any, if all these scores on the ERMI are one and two digit, maybe a occasional three digit, and one of them's a four, five, or six digit, it's going to blow the sensitivity of that ERMI score. So, I mean, out of these 36, if one of them's way off, it's going to greatly affect the result of that ERMI score. So we find the ERMI score. Uh, Dr. Shoemaker picked out five species of group one, the water damage molds on building material, that he feels strongly and has evidence create the most bulk of contaminant and the most virulent mycotoxin chemicals. He picked those five out as species to use in a Hertz me score. The Hertz me is a medical acronym. It's just too sickly laughable that it sounds hurts me. <laughs> it hurts you or something like that. Right. You got to have a little humor in here somewhere, right? Absolutely. The first time I heard that name from uh, <laughs> Dr. John Laurence, I started laughing. I was like, there's no way they called it the hurts me test. <laughs> <laughs> so the way he scored that for each of these five uh, species, <clears throat> if, if, for example, <clears throat> he had different scoring on each of these five, for example, on the Aspergillus uh, pinoceotes, I call it Aspen, took only three months to say pinoceotes, but you got to have a little humor in the sick stuff. <laughs> but if that score were zero through nine, he gives it zero gigs. If it's 10 through 99, it gives it four gigs and so on. That each one of these species gets a score of zero, four, six, or 10. And then he adds those up for all five, and that's called the Hertz me score. 
So he and a colleague, Dave Aguark, who owns Enviro Biomics, did a study over 18 months of 822 patients who have been treated and reentered their homes. And for Hertz Me and Army scores, they came up with interesting correlations. For example, if the Hertz Me score zero through 10, average patient relapse was 1.7%. Between 10 and 15 was 47% over 15 was over 90%. The higher over 15, the closer to 100%. So this is really useful, interesting stuff that's helpful. So when we try to assess what's going on in a home, if we get those kind of scores, you know, we think neat things need to be done to make corrections, to stop causes, to clean up what needs to be cleaned up. But now, there's some newer medical testing. One of them is called Genie, all capitals like Genie in the bottle. And it's a genetic test. It's pricey, but it's very interesting in that as you live in a home and you go get tested with this test, it will tell you which things are actually causing you and stimulating your problem. Is it the actinos, the endos, the molds, or a combination of, or none of? It also gives other great genetic information. The reagent they use at the two labs that do this is used highly in COVID research, so it's in short supply. So those tests are running slow right now. They need a special treatment on the blood draw and the shipment. But be aware of it. You don't necessarily need it. But in some cases, it helps us in the environmental area that if we know you're acting only on actinos and not the mold stuff, and we do the testing and the actinos are low and the molds are high, we can maybe offer some less expensive treatments for you than having to go the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a new, we're on the cutting edge of so much with this. We're kind of learning as we go. Yeah, uh, and guys, if, if you want to work with Larry um, or see if it's a fit, Go to safestartiaq.com, S-A-F-E-S-T-A-R-T-I-A-Q.com. I'm going to mention it a few times throughout just because uh, it makes it easy. And that way, you know, we don't just have it at the end of the episode. Uh, that is pretty wild with the Genie genetic testing and figuring out what's responsible, which, which mold species are responsible for your symptoms. And then based on that, what types of remediations would need to be done you know, right. so it's it's spending a little bit more on the genetic testing from Genie, but possibly saving you money on the back end with with targeting your remediation. Yeah, and if you want info on Genie, if you go to the survivingmold.com website, uh, you can get information on that. Uh, it was developed through their auspices, and they kind of have those labs. I think it's really important. I want to go into if you're going to do any of your own testing, how to collect dust. So I want you to think about this. This is kind of interesting. In your home, there's area, first of all, you don't want to do any collections where there had been or is currently water damage or mold growth that's going to bias the result. Mm. It's going to show much higher than the reality. Okay. Second, you don't want to take samples around where air comes in from outside, like around window frames, window sills, door, exterior door frames because there's things that may come in from outside that would show up that are not good, that would make your house look worse than maybe it is. Think about this, there's old dust and new dust. The reason I differentiate that, old dust is in places you don't normally clean, like top of door frames, maybe the top and back of your computer too often. And new dust is places you normally dust like the top of you know, your furniture, your tables, whatever. So the old dust has more analog history to it. So like of these five species in the Hertz Me test, two of them are hydrophilic. They require 90 to 95% water activity to grow. Two of them are xerophilic. They require 60, 70% minimum water to grow. So, so for example, when I look at results, if the hydrophilics are very low, indicating very low evidence of water damage on that history on that dust. And the xerophilics are high, and I know they're very common in soils outdoors. I may judge that 
a lot of your contaminants are coming in from outdoors through negative pressure and air movement. Uh, another thing on, on the collection is, think about items in walls in your home as receivers and emitters, like catchers and throwers. So here's, here's another analogy that always gets a laugh from my clients. Picture this analogy. You're trying to open an umbrella in a hurricane or you open it and it gets overwhelmed. So when you're gonna use like equipment to clean things out of the air in the home, they can easily get overwhelmed. It's not like buying a HEPA air filter and throwing it in the house and it's a magic bullet. These devices have to handle the load of bad stuff coming at them, just like rain in a hurricane. I know I diverted a little, but in this dust collection, where I'm getting at is you don't go around licking the walls and the floors. It's the air you breathe that's that's getting you. And that's the analogy I use for that. But uh, so the deal is you want to get collections where things will come off surfaces into the air you're breathing. You don't want to get collections on areas where dust gathers and collects but doesn't go back into the air for two reasons. For example, if you're going to you feel, oh, gee, this is easy. I'm going to get dust off this return vent. There's a lot of dust. So when you do that, yeah, you get a lot of dust. The lab can run the test, but you're going to get maybe higher than realistic result numbers because you're getting dust that's been collecting over a longer time period, and these values are building up. Secondly, you're getting dust off a surface that's not projecting it into the air. So you gotta be very careful where you collect dust. So we have actually a printed protocol that's more specific. We can send to you if we work with you to help you and guide you. And if we're working with you and you want more help, we can do a FaceTime while you're collecting dust and you know give you a more specific direction. Because I'm telling you, there's nothing more important than getting as accurate as you can data on this test. There's so many important decisions and money involved in how you deal with these answers. And unfortunately, the labs, and I love the labs, and they do great work at what they do, they, they will send you their idea of how and where you should collect dust. And I'm going to tell you, sure, you can do that, but I don't know that they're looking at all these innuendos that are so important. So, you know, if, if you want help with that, you'll you'll deal with myself or colleagues of mine that are qualified to help you with that. It just means so much. And the labs are trying to help. They're not bad guys at all. But I mean, everybody should kind of stay in their box, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it seems like there's not a one size fits all recommendation. Like, here's the type of spot you want to collect dust, because as you mentioned, every home, every building is different. So it's looking at, at it's looking at the, you know, the biology of the building and then saying based on that, where, uh, which places to collect dust best meet the overall criteria that we have found to be successful and, and produce it, it, accurate yeah. measurements. Even if we work with you virtually, which we're doing a lot these days, mm -hmm. we actually started doing that three, four years ago. And it's developed ironically with, I mean, nobody, none of us are happy with this COVID, but we're doing boots on the ground. We have team members going out and doing, you know, on-site visits and such. We're working with a lot of people where it's either the distance or the money when we're working virtually. And we gather all the info we need. We get the pictures, the floor plans. Uh, we send you a questionnaire. We give you directions on the testing. Uh, we go over the results. We develop a treatment plan. We help you if needed. Find the right contractors if they're available to help you. We can provide oversight on work being done if it's desired. We can do oversight on decisions, you know. Is it worth it? What's the risk? Should I do the remediation? If I spend X dollars, what's the probable outcome? Or should I consider moving? And how do, how do I handle things in a move? And the big things are always the personal property. You know, people say, you know, I'm in these chat rooms all the time, and they're all telling me throw everything out. You don't have to do that. I mean, we have specific uh, protocols on how to deal with these things. And uh, 
some things you may have to throw out, but there's a lot you can do that the cost and effort might be worth it. Sometimes it costs more to fix than to replace, but you know, we work through all this with you. It can get mm -hmm. very detailed. Yeah, and it's what what we found as well is like we had um, someone else do the testing before hiring you, and they only looked at I guess the the type of mold that would fall into that like traditional category. They weren't looking for a mold toxicity that, that would produce um, the you know the the immune immunological effects in that, uh, in that traditional paradigm. Right. They were in the traditional paradigm. And, you know, um, this was my mom and I hadn't talked. She was just like, oh, we just need someone to check for mold. So she went online and said, you know, mold inspector and then assumed. Right. They came back and they said, no, the house is fine. Right. And then we brought you in. We find out where we've got this uh, this hurts me score of like fifteen or sixteen. That's you know nine over ninety percent chance of of producing illness. And and and, and, and you know my, my mom's pissed, <laughs> understandably so. She goes, "How did they miss this?" You know. So it's guys. I'm mentioning that just because learn from from my mistakes. It's not as simple as just going online and saying, "Find me a mold inspector." You know, you have to have someone that's that's using the right tool and diagnostics and testing methods and, and, and of course, has a lot of uh, a, a track record of adequate, um, sufficient remediation like Larry does. So if you want to work with him, safestartiaq.com. Larry, please continue. Okay. Um, I'm kind of looking over some notes of things I want to talk about. Um, we've hit a bunch of that. You know, it's really unfortunate just what you're bringing up, Anthony, about there's so much the world in general doesn't know and everybody trusts, you know, you call a mold expert per se. I mean, who knows there's differences between inflammatory and paradigm. And, you know, the traditional guy come in, they'll do honest work for what they know. They're just not at the same level. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand the whole medical background in it and all of that. And it's, it's an emerging field. I have mm -hmm. like three, four colleagues around the country. We're all pretty much the same level. We're all pretty overloaded. We're trying to train. I've been training people to do what I do. I've got a gentleman I'm working with down in Texas and one in upstate New York, one in Florida. Uh, I've got two locally that are assisting and helping gather data. If we do boots on the ground, by the way, we do additional testing with handheld instruments for formaldehyde, volatile organic compounds, electromagnetic fields and such. I wanna to mention too on our website, we have a little shop, it's, believe me, it's no percentage of our revenue, but we try to gather a lot of things if people don't know where to go to find what they need. And a lot of the stuff on there connects you directly to Amazon where you can purchase it. But as an example, <clears throat> Some of the instruments there, we have a recommended electromagnetic field meter if one wanted that. It's in a range of maybe it's under $150. Uh, another meter that measures VOCs and formaldehyde, same kind of price range. And we can kind of talk them through how to use it. There's products in there like paints that reduce electromagnetic fields, different kind of shields. Uh, uh, particle counters, uh, all kind of stuff, caulking cord to kind of, to stop air communication around windows and doors with the outside. It's like peel and strip licorice, except it's like a putty-like rope that you can press in around the frame if we need to slow down air communication. There's these little die-cut pads to put behind electrical switch plates that stop air from the building envelope from coming into the house. So different things we might recommend. I mean, as a, as a, as a client, a consumer, I mean, we tell you to get, to get these things, you don't know where to go in the first place and what to get. So it's a convenience. You know, you can find a lot of interesting stuff on there. And, and, and so many of those tools I now consider indispensable. I mean, just, just, 
take, for example, the um, a, a, me a meter that measures electromagnetic frequencies, yeah. you know, wireless, which is like your radio frequency, your magnetic and oh, your yeah, electrical like fields. That, that I can't tell you how many times that has gotten myself and clients out of really sticky situations where they thought that there was a, a degree of illness or dis-ease coming from within them. And it was actually something in their environment, right? Me, yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you about three weeks ago, one of my uh, affiliates uh, flew out to Seattle to check a couple of homes for a client boots on the ground on site. And one of them is an older home, a ranch on a crawl space with an addition on a crawl space. Even though there was a lot of past water damage and some fairly visible mold, the Hertz Me Army testing didn't come out real bad. The Actinos did, but what was of major concern, because our client has a daughter living there, this is his sister's house, and the daughter's inflammatory. The formaldehyde was at two times EPA threshold levels for carcinogenic effects, and the volatile organic compounds were way off the top. And we had to recommend that you know, that all of them should, should move out of that house until things are corrected. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, most of the time it's just the water damage. And if we suspect things, even on a virtual, we can recommend our client to buy these things and we can walk them through the house virtually with these instruments and give them guidance. So we can also, in some cases, we'll find a good local, like a good home inspector, if we feel we need boots on the ground and they can't afford to bring us out to come in there and we give them a protocol and, you know, or the lead on it, telling them what to look for, what kind of instruments to use, especially we're looking at things like drainage and uh, a lot of things that may need an eyeball on it. This episode of the Biohacking Secrets Show is brought to you by Veritas Farms and their full line of CBD products, CBD standing for cannabidiol. Now, we are real excited about this partnership because Veritas means truth in Latin, and we are big believers in bringing you guys the truth, not just through this podcast, but by making sure that any products that we share or that we bring on as sponsors are products that we personally use, believe in, and endorse ourselves. And that is the case with Veritas Farms and their full line of CBD products. The reason that they're so great, they are full spectrum hemp products, meaning that they have all of the beneficial phytonutrients that you get in a quality CBD product. 99% of the CBD products on the market are CBD isolate, and they're just being resold, meaning they're coming from a few small manufacturers. They've only got one tiny part of all of the important phytonutrients that you need to get the benefits you want from a CBD product, and they're just a bunch of different companies reselling them. Veritas Farms is vertically integrating, meaning they own the farm. They ensure that there are no pesticides being added. It's organic, and then they control the entire process from harvesting to extraction until that product ends up at your door. That's what I love. It. It's kind of like farm to table, but for CBD. And the benefits that I've noticed, my sleep is better. I feel like I get a deeper, more restful night's sleep. I'm less stressed. I never have periods of anxiety. I feel calm and focused throughout the day, and it even decreases inflammation inflammation when I have flights or other things where inflammation is an inevitable part of life. You take a little extra CBD and it can be very helpful for stress, anxiety, sleep, and that inflammation. So if you guys want to check it out, we've arranged a 15% discount for you guys. To get that, you can go to theveritasfarms.com forward slash biohacks. I'll spell it out. T-H-E-V-E-R-I-T-A-S-F-A-R-M-S.com forward slash B-I-O-H-A-C-K-S to save 15%. Check out the Veritas Farms CBD. You guys are going to absolutely love it. Okay, so I, I think we're, we have a pretty good idea of like diagnosing, um, you know, either through symptom-based diagnoses or the, the biotoxin mold illness panel that they've got at Life Extension or, or that you can get using a, a Schumacher trained uh, pr professional or physician. We've got the visual contrast sensitivity tests that you mentioned. And then there's like the mycotoxin tests from Great Plains Labs or real-time labs. Um, we talked about how to 
test your home, which is different than diagnosing yourself. And that's like um, working with someone like you by going to safestartiaq.com and, and talking with someone from your team. And if, you know, if someone was super, super strapped and they were really willing to kind of in some ways roll the dice, they could, we talked about the Hertz Me Too test and, and the ERMI test from Envirobiomics. Um, and how do we determine, like, let's say mold is found, right? And you talked about some of the remediation strategies with from ventilation to air purification to cleaning. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe we can get into anything that we didn't cover that you think is important to note around remediation and, um, and, and that process, you know, just so that if, let's say someone doesn't have the ability to work with you mm-hmm. or, um, you know, you're overloaded or something like that, they could at least have someone that's helping with the remediation, listen to this conversation and, uh, you know, do some of the right things. Um, so I'm curious when it comes to remediation and then also to move or not to move, right. Let's kind of cover that phase of the, of the process. Okay. In the remediation, it's a series of steps. Again, going back to traditional and inflammatory, <clears throat> Traditional re- remediation follows guidelines of an insurance industry group called IICRC. They have a protocol called S520, talks about mold remediation, and it's, it's in the traditional paradigm. They don't talk about using chemicals. They try to tell you removing or getting rid of the mold or damage is best, and we agree with that in traditional A lot of traditional remediators today use chemicals, and we recommend not. We find things that kill mold actually don't do a good job of doing that. And a lot of times it's used where what you're killing is already dead, so you don't need to use those strong chemicals that can affect a patient. So in traditional, we have our own methods of cleaning and encapsulating if needed that are safe for an inflammatory patient. So the first step in cleanup is to try finding and close up all the causes. And some of the causes may be past or current water damage or molds growing or had grown. And we call that traditional remediation. So that's step one. <clears throat> step two, if there's a forced air HVAC, is the proper type of duct cleaning and then sealing that system. Step three is a process we call small particle cleaning. And we have a a long protocol for that for the contractor. But it involves trying to isolate the content from the structure because cleaning one or the other cross contaminates the other one. And then, for example, the walls and shelves and interior are specially cleaned to remove these dry contaminants. And then content is cleaned in another area then the air in the house is treated to remove ultrafine and nanoparticles. Then the clean contents brought back into the clean structure. So it's a whole process. And even the content, we have different uh, protocols for how to clean content. Some of it that's more soft goods, we use a process called air washing outside with compressed air and HEPA vacuum outside and such. And on that stuff, it's probably 70, 80% effective. Some patients are so sensitive, it may not be enough. And maybe that item needs to be discarded or, or given away. Sometimes it can be upholstered. We're learning upholstery almost costs more than buying new stuff. I mean, strange things. So in the, in the treatment, uh, not everybody needs small particle cleaning protocol. So that's one of the things, but before we do that, we have to cap off all the causes and sources, which might be adding some mechanical equipment to the HVAC system to create positive pressure in the home to keep outdoor influence from coming in. And we work with contractors and have protocols on how they should set that up so they're bringing in safe, clean air to pressurize with special filtering, We have them slow down the exhaust air to create positive pressure. We recommend specific devices. If we get into air purification, there's two methods. One is filtering, simple, like a HEPA filter. You take particles out of the air of certain size. 
Another are devices called PCO, photocatalytic oxidation. Instead of filtering particles, they chemically react with the particles to make them, uh, to make them safe and they leave in their wake an atom of water or carbon dioxide. So the right concentration and number of these devices depend on the uniqueness of the home. And for example, Michelle Fisher in my organization is trained by these manufacturers. If we go that route to size what they need and what concentration where they should be to do the job right, so they don't get overwhelmed like the umbrella in the hurricane. And uh, we, we offer a proposal for how to do that right. Uh, some cases, the ventilation is the right treatment. So some cases may need some of all three of that, but here's a good thing. Almost all of us have different levels of what we can handle financially in this. I mean, it'd be nice to be able to do all the things you need to do from the get-go. On the other hand, you don't wanna take 10 steps up the ladder if you can get there in two or three. So for a lot of people, if, they, if, if their health is such, they can do it and the conditions, we'll take things a step at a time and see how they work. Take a step, measure it, take another step if you need. If you're good at that point, stop taking steps. So some, some inexpensive ways to monitor, it's not 100% accurate, but it gives you a good guide. It's like if you do this visual contrast sensitivity test at the beginning and at different stages you retake it and see if you see improvement or not, discuss it with your physician. Physician may wanna do other tests with you. Uh, so we can help guide the, the client and the patient to do this in a reasonable way that fits their needs. It's personalized. We deal very much with a, uh, a modus operandi that we want it right. We want it right for the least cost and effort. You can't be penny wise and pound foolish. Even if you spend a fair amount, but not a lot, if it doesn't do it, it's money down the drain. Mm -hmm. So you can't be penny wise and pound foolish. What you do, you have to do right. And we take a position like if we were you or your children or my children, you know, knowing what I do, what, what would I do? We're not magic, we don't walk on water, but we, we can't guarantee your health, but we can make your home as environmentally safe as possible. There might be other health issues going on, we're not the expert in that, but we do work with your physicians in trying to get it right. And are there, are there best practices? You know, I've heard things along the lines of the, like the air filters that you put in your vents, right? They have this MERV rating. And I've heard certain people say like, if you use like MERV, uh, I don't know, 13 or something, it dramatically, it dramatically reduces the, your mold exposure. And, and, you know, if you put these types of air filters, you know, there's, there's the molecule and the air doctor and all these things like that can make a big difference. What are your thoughts on that? Are there some, some best practices or is a lot of that? Yeah, just... I'll touch on it. We might have to save some of this for another podcast. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I think but so. Let me tell you this, this MERV thing, the higher the MERV rating, the smaller particles the filter will filter. Mm -hmm. And the problem is some of these higher numbered MERVs have so much drag or friction pushing air through them that it requires more work to get the air through at the speed you need. Mm -hmm. So we've seen cases where a fan motor on a furnace may burn out mm -hmm. or seize up because mm -hmm. it's having to do too much work to push air through the filter. Yeah. So you, you wanna talk to your a good HVAC contractor if you wanna consult with people like us. And even the higher MERVs generally at the best get down to HEPA, which is 0.3 microns, 0.3, uh, point, let's see, 0.3, uh, what is it? Of, of a, 0.3 millionths of a meter in size. Mm -hmm hard to filter. You can filter smaller. We work with filters with low drag that filter 100 times smaller than HEPA. Uh, they can be put on a furnace system. It, it's, a, it's, it's a specialty area that we deal with that we can talk about in detail at a time. The, the deals like molecule 
and Air Oasis and iAdapt Air and High Tech Air Solutions. Those are all these photocatalytic devices. They create molecules generally of OH that want to be H2O or CO. So they basically have a chemical reaction with contaminants. And they do other things that are very good. And we like them in combination. Uh, you know, that's a, it's going to take a long time to talk just on that subject. Sure, sure. We I can say that. We can save that if you guys are enjoying this conversation and uh, and you want uh, an even deeper dive into some of this, some of these mold topics. Um, let let Larry and I know, and we'll uh, we'll get a part two going and on the books. Um, Larry, anything else that you want to cover around around the remediation to move or not to move? How do you make yeah, that determination? Yeah, that and after that, I'm going to need to scoot here soon. Yeah, yeah. Then we'll we'll kind of wrap it up and let people know where to find you. But on move or not to move, uh, when I put together information for a talk I gave on that, I started it out on the the money end of it, and I put together like to sell and buy a home. If that's the scenario we're talking about, besides the commission, there's you know all the ancillary fees of attorneys, title and all this stuff, I figured all that out. I took an example of a $300,000 home, which aren't around a whole lot today in single families, but there, there's a lot of real estate in that price range. And I figured out the, all the costs together to, affect, it's not really the six, seven, five, six, seven percent of the commission. Uh, with all the cost in there, it comes into, Wait, I want to think. I added into this the cost to purchase another home and an approximate moving cost and some fix up cost. And it came to about 10 to 12% of the sale price. So on this $300,000 home, we're talking about $30,000 plus. And most people don't feel that much. They feel the out of pocket cost, but assuming they have the equity, God willing that's going to come out of their equity, not out of their pocketbook or their wallet. Mm -hmm. So it's not too hard to do the move financially, but that's the real cost involved. Mm -hmm. okay, so now let's weigh that against the cost of a remediation. Let's say the remediation comes to 20 or 25,000 to do it all right and small particle cleaning and all. And they're fairly close. And then you have to ask, okay, if I spend money on remediation, before I decide if I'm moving or not, what's the risk if I do it, it's gonna come out good and stay good. So like we have some tools called Mold Propensity Index, which I'd like to do if we do another podcast. That's a way to do a visual assessment and answer a bunch of questions on eight functional areas of the home from visual observation. That overall in the home, we can come up with a risk that that home's gonna allow water or create mold or not is a is like a probability number and we can break it down by functional area of the home for example the roofing the exterior the plumbing the hvac the topography and so on what's the risk in each of those areas and of things that are easily correctable what can be correctable to reduce that risk so if you can get a low risk with a high probability of a good outcome by remediation, you know, that might be the right answer. And then we go into, if you move, how do we address dealing with your content? Do we clean it at point A or point B? If it's at A, how do we protect it in transit in a, in a van that may recontaminate it? And then at point B, how do we assess point B that that's a healthy, safe place for you? And what should you do the point B before you move in it, if needed, to make sure it's going to be a good environment for you from the get-go. And what's the risk point B is going to stay good? What should you do at point B to reduce that risk, if any? So there's so many pieces to the puzzle. Yeah. We help work the client through that. And, but it's you know, there's a lot of money and a, a lot of uh, I mean our health, which is everything on the line. It's important yeah. to 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 have good critical thinking skills and a, a process that takes everything into account. Yeah, with, with all your cards the emotional impact of a move with 
especially if they're children in schools and neighborhoods. And, you know, mm -hmm. if you want to stay in the same neighborhood, the same school district and mm -hmm. uh, all the work. I mean, even if it's all great, the work and effort involved in doing a move, you know, for some people is monumental. If you're one of these patients and you have, you know, fatigue issues and all, I mean, the thought of a move can be an overwhelming deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, this has been fantastic. I mean, just I want to mention just to kind of fulfill on my promise from the beginning, guys, when it comes to when it comes to how do you get better? You know, if you're dealing with some of this stuff, first and foremost, make sure you you reach out to Larry at, at safestartiaq.com. Talk with someone for him or someone from his team and get the right testing done. When it comes to getting better, I just want to mention some of the things we've seen uh, help. And if you guys want help with this stuff, you know, feel free to go to biohackercoaching.com and apply to see if see if our program's a fit, but gentle sweating through sauna or infrared sauna, the binders, um, systemic formulas makes a great product called bind that you could take before bed. Um, for some individuals, melatonin can help quell the, uh, the cytokine storm from mold exposure. And this one's a little bit controversial, but, um, we know that a lot of physicians will use stimulants to, um, increase the amount of biotoxins the body eliminates. It, it does seem like some people, um, feel better with a little bit of caffeine, or even in some cases, I've seen prescription stimulants like an Adderall actually help turn someone's life around that was bedridden with, uh, with mold toxicity. And it's more than, than them just jacking themselves up. It's actually pushing some of those biotoxins out of the body. And then, and then there's other things like coffee enemas and stuff we could get into. I just wanted to mention those because I did say at the beginning that we were going to talk about how to get better. Um, long story short, it's always best to work with an expert like Larry. Um, and then, you know, if we're on the healing side, that's and, and, and you've done the testing, that's something that I may be able to help you with. Um, so one last time, I'll mention it, go to safestartiaq.com. And if you guys got value from this episode, you know, please share it with people who need it, um, or, you know, maybe dealing with some of these some of these conditions like chronic fatigue or Lyme disease and uh, headaches, chemical sensitivities that are slowing them down. Uh, Larry, this has been fantastic. I think you shared a ton of knowledge. I, I, I believe this is a resource that's going to help a lot of people. Um, what's the, the the best way for folks to stay up to date with things you're working on or um, to reach out to you if it's not through the safestartiaq.com website? Oh, good, good question. Uh, people get to us a number of different ways. The website is one of the best. Uh, I have a lady working, Michelle Fisher. She's actually a SERS patient. She's doing a phenomenal job. She's also a trained health coach uh, from Duke. And uh, we do offer sessions too for clients that are patients that want to get into some like five session type group uh, health coaching. And we find that helps a lot of, a lot of the patients. And we bring in an expert to each session. I do one of them. Some physicians come into some of them. Um, we also, by the way, I just want to throw in, I have protocols I've written for building environmentally safe homes. We've had about 30 clients around the country work with their builders and architects. They've all worked out really well without a lot of detail. But as far as communicating with us, uh, we have a phone number. It tends to get overwhelmed, but I... I want to stress, we give all the time we need to each client we work with. That's why some people may have to wait a little longer to work with us. But, I mean, they've already waited a long time in their life. We're not talking about long waits. We're talking to maybe a few days to a few weeks or so. But uh, we, we, we stress that we work, we're passionate about our work. We want to get it right. Uh, we enjoy, we love what we do. We put in a lot of hours. But it's, it's very rewarding. But um, I guess, you know, I, I would say for right now, uh, either you, if you want to use the landline, I think it's 847-913-9200, uh, you'll get a call back within a couple days. But again, because we give everybody the time they need, we're not a huge enterprise. We have people we need. We're adding field staff. But we're more concerned about our quality and getting it right. 
Well, yeah, you, you have done a fantastic job with, with our home and, um, everything, all the tools and strategies that you've used have been things that other colleagues and physicians who I consider to, to also be, uh, at the bleeding edge have said, Hey, these are the tests you want to run here are the processes you want to follow. And you're using all of it. Um, so I think that, that what you're doing at safestartiiq.com is huge and I appreciate it. And I appreciate you taking the time and spending, you know, over 90 yeah, minutes. Listen, I really enjoyed today. this and I, I love teaching and I love teaching talking about it. They never get tired of it. And uh, there's just so much we need to know. Uh, one of my biggest challenges is to try to get more information on all of this to more people so they get the right treatments for what they need. Yeah, well, this will definitely help do that. And um, yeah. appreciate you. And, and guys, if you want us to do a part two, reach out to me and Larry, let us know and we'll get it on the books. Larry, thank you so Great. much. Thank you. What's up, guys? Anthony here, and thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Biohacking Secrets Show. One of my favorite things to do is helping men and women like you feel what it's like with the body you've always wanted and all-day energy that starts the moment you wake up and doesn't quit. Over the past decade, we've created a proprietary health assessment that helps me to identify the unique toxicities and deficiencies that may be holding you back from the life that you deserve. And what we've discovered in doing this with now thousands of CEOs, executives, professional athletes, businessmen, Hollywood celebrities, and entrepreneurs is that there's always room for improvement and optimization. Whether you're already performing at a high level or you have that feeling inside your heart that you're capable of more, the single fastest way to unlock your potential is to upgrade your mind and your body. And there's no program on earth that does that faster or to a greater magnitude than our one-on-one -on -one consulting program at www.biohackingsecrets.com forward slash coaching. We start with our proprietary health assessment that screens you for vitamin deficiencies like A, D, magnesium, iron, etc., high cholesterol and heart disease, high blood pressure, digestive disorders, hidden infections like Lyme, Epstein-Barr, parasites, SIBO, Candida, and more that can just drain your energy in the background, especially if you don't know about them. Anxiety, depression, and cognitive disorders, autoimmune disease, adrenal fatigue, thyroid issues, mold toxicity, heavy metals, environmental toxins, and other genetic risk factors like MTHFR, APOE status, your glutathione production, and many more. We even recommend the specific tests that I use with my one-on-one -on -one clients if they're relevant for you in figuring out your biological age and identifying those key areas and opportunities that can take your life to the next level. From there, we create a customized game plan along with a personalized supplement protocol to help you optimize your weight and energy at the cellular level. And for our platinum clients, we even include a personalized workshop with me in Delray Beach, Florida. Most of the year, this program's full with a waiting list, but we just had a couple spots open up and I wanted to offer them to the listeners of the Biohacking Secrets show first. So if you're interested in seeing what it might look like for us to work together, head over to www.biohackingsecrets.com forward slash coaching. That's www.biohackingsecrets.com forward slash C-O-A-C-H-I-N-G and fill out the short application form. If you're pre-approved, you'll be given the opportunity to book a time to connect with someone on our team and see if it's a fit. Thank you so much for being a part of this community, and I look forward to potentially going on this journey together.